that that song is uh, it's a decree it's a a prayer of our heart but it's actually speaking I believe of it's a prophetic song ready or not he's coming he's doing it he's moving you know and we have an opportunity to play uh, to surrender our will as you know that's the one thing he can't do he can't make you surrender your will what an opportunity, what an, uh, just daily, but even just tonight, just to say, Father, have your way in my life. Father, we just tell you tonight, have your way. Have your way in us. Have your way in our families. Have your way in our homes, Father. Have your way, Father, in our schedules. Have your way. Just have your way. Have your way. Have your way tonight. Have your way. In this, in us, your people, Father. Have your way. Father, let your plans be brought forth by these hands. But let your plans be brought forth by the church. Father, we just say yes to you tonight. We say yes to your plans. We say yes to you. We trust you. We trust you. Oh, there's just such a a joy in trusting you. Oh, thank you that you are on the throne, that you cannot be removed. Father, we trust you. You're so good. Oh, thank you for victory. Thank you that we we, we, we... we walk in victory. Thank you for the a victory view in our hearts, a victory view. Thank you, Father. Thank you for hearts right now. Just hope and that picture of hope becoming brighter, just taking over what would look like despair. Father, thank you for the word uh, and the testimony of your spirit Bring to our remembrance even now. Everything that you've said, the words that you've spoken to us, the words that have been spoken through us. Father, thank you for your for, for your, the Spirit of God, your Spirit reminded us now of everything. You are the author, but you're the finisher. Father, we trust you tonight. We trust you. We trust you with our nation. Father, we trust you. We trust you. Father, we trust you with our path. We trust you with our children. We trust you for with today. We trust you with tomorrow. We trust you in every way. We trust you, Father. We trust you. We trust you. Father, thank you for your plans. Thank you for your plans. The plans uh, uh, for a church that's mobilized. Thank you for that there are things for us to do, that there is a purpose and a destiny and good things for us to walk in that you've created before we were ever born. Thank you for those good things that our eyes haven't seen and, and, and our ears haven't heard, Lord, that we couldn't produce the things that we can't produce, that you've prepared, that you desire for, that you desire through us, your church, that all men would be saved. That you said, ask that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, to come to the knowledge of you. Father, we're asking tonight, just according to what we've declared for years now, to know you and to make you known. Father, let us know you more intimately. Let us see you more clearly. Let us increase in our knowledge of you and that grace would abound in the knowledge of you. That there would be a touch from heaven on us and upon your people for this nation, for this world. Father, for for our community. Touch us tonight. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your grace that's administered even tonight through the knowledge of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you that our eyes are open that our eyes are open, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that, 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 that the Holy Ghost is the teacher. Oh, Father, thank you that we have understanding, that there's just such a, a teaching and an understanding tonight, and eyes open and ears that hear. Be the teacher. Father, take us to your school. Take us to a, 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 a new level, a new, a, a new way of learning, a higher way of learning, and just deposits in the name of Jesus by just a revelation, a work that only you can do, but a work uh, that we are seated here for. Father, we're here tonight to hear from you. 
We're here tonight to learn of you, to meet with you, ah, to be equipped by you. Father, I thank you for that even tonight, that, that, that there is an equipping uh, or a completing, a perfecting of the saints. That's us, your people, for the works of the ministry. you got something for us to do. We're not sitting on our hands. We're not waiting. Oh, but Father, that we're active. We thank you for it. We honor you tonight. We give you praise in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that was, our, I guess, our prayer part tonight. <laughs> so go ahead and chair, grab a chair. I'd say... Uh, High five somebody, but I don't know. I guess we're still doing that deal a little bit. Um, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord over every every sickness. Jesus is Lord over every disease. Jesus is Lord over your home. If you're not, if there's not peace in your home, Jesus is Lord. Declare that. And um, I'm telling you, there's something about our voice that is necessary on in this earth. Uh, today and we were me and Pastor Evan we're going to teach tonight and uh, I, I get the privilege of doing it tonight because um, I said well you can but I feel like I, I need to kind of pick up from Sunday just a touch and if you weren't here on Sunday um, I, tell, I would encourage you to go check out that uh, check out that message and I believe it'll really bless you I really do and so we talked a little bit about um, grace to you. Um, and, and this is something that was really interesting that if you look at the letters to the church from Paul that had, he says this, he says that there was a grace upon him to be a wise master builder or to lay the foundations of the church. Paul says this, that there was something given to me that, that enabled me to do what I couldn't do on my own. And, and, and so you, you see that, that he was very aware of this grace. And I think um, we might get to doing some of this tonight, I'm not sure. But really even grace and the, the similarity of, he said, the grace given to me would, would be translated, and you could almost say the anointing, or I have been anointed. And we talked a little bit on Sunday about grace and how grace, uh, uh, you know, comes from this word charis, which, which was a, a word that Paul talked, uh, was trying to communicate, communicate Christi, a Christian idea, not just an idea, but a truth to a world that had no idea about this before, this new covenant that was implemented by Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, there was not language for, uh, but there was a lot of language of the day and age that he was sent to the Gentiles, okay, not the Hebrew people, but to the Gentiles, and he would try to explain to them the, the message of the gospel or the good news, right? And so this is huge for, for us to understand that, that he took words that would have was Greek. It was written in Greek. The New Testament was written in Greek. It was spoken. It was the Roman Empire. Okay, this is the language of the day. And so here's what was spoken. He would take and try to create an uh, communicate an idea the same way Jesus did among farmers. He talked in parables. He talked about fish. He talked about trees. He talked, okay, you understand he talked that way. And so here now you have Paul with a grace or an anointing to communicate a message. And so he talks about grace and grace, the grace of God. And this word he uses, this word cherish which is a word that means touched by God, by the gods. And so this word charis would be where we get this word uh, charis or charisma, charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, charisma, I okay, know you understand like in the modern, or not modern day, but English language, it almost looks like the Greek word uh, of charis, which is grace, we translate grace. So you see this, he's, he's communicating that there is a, a grace that is given to us, that we've been saved by grace, there's, a, there's a, in a sense almost as if the God's touched us, um, and there, there's a grace to do things. There's a grace to overcome. There's a grace, and Paul starts out every letter by, by saying this, grace to you, grace and peace to you. So it's really interesting, and so we talked just a little bit about that. I don't want to take time to really go into that. There's so much more than even when we got to on Sunday, but I wanted to, to really hit on tonight, not so much grace to you, but grace through you. So tonight we were going to be talking about we're, um, and praying for our nation and the elections. And, and all of that is vital and it's important and we need to be doing that and we need to do it corporately and we need to do it on our own time. But when the election's over, what do you do then? And, and not even what do you do then to when the election's over, but let's talk about 365 until we're talking about 365 starting today until the election Upon the election, on the other side of the election, what is it that we're supposed to do? You know, uh, what, what, is, what, what, what is my role? So God's role was to save me, right? 
grace. By, he came down, and in a sense, it, it, was the blood, it was his love for me. And we talked about how grace, cheris, comes from a word that, me, that is C-H-A-I-R-O instead of C-H-A-R-I-S, which means to rejoice. And so the gods, in a sense, this word would, would have meant the gods rejoiced over you, uh, and this is why they touched you and empowered you that other people are very aware of, um, and, and, and you're now able to do what you couldn't do before. And so there's, and I'm, and I'm, I'm sorry, you're going to have to listen to Sunday for me to, I don't want you to think I'm getting like all kooky here, Okay. So you're going to have to listen to Sunday to, to pick up, all right? But here's what Paul said. Grace, he would say grace to you, grace to you, grace to you. But tonight I want to talk about grace through you. Grace through you. In this day and age in which we live, not just today in which we live, but I'm talking about from the day that Jesus spoke to the disciples in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, or in the end of Matthew, verse 28 and 18, 19, you see what did he say? Go make disciples, or he said, go preach the gospel. There is something that we've been, the great commission found in Matthew, or go into all the world and preach the gospel. Okay, this is that. That's like that's a reoccurring dream of hearing that that one scripture, Mark sixteen fifteen, um, it, it, that I had that, uh, as a young young boy sitting in the back of this uh, junior high group under the sound system that was above, and I can see this video. I can see this vision or this dream because I had it uh, too uh, too many times to, to where I thought, what does that mean? I asked my wife, uh, my wife's mom. Well, she's not my wife. She wasn't then. She was my friend's mom. It was a pastor, Pastor Susan, and I said, you think? this means anything? And she said, yeah, I, I think that does. And I kept on having, hearing this word, go into all the world, preach the gospel. And I was the cool kid in the back, in the starter jacket, Michigan Wolverine. You don't, I all don't know. Okay. Um, you know, and they had those big pockets, you know, you know, the hood, everything. You know, I was just kind of sitting, it's like here, here the Lord just kind of showed up and, and visited me in a sense and called me out and spoke to me very clearly, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And as of late, I've found myself asking, um, and even coming back after a hunting trip, okay, you jump in and you, and you kind of get some certain things rolling, and then you kind of ask yourself, well, what else am I supposed to do? Yeah, I know you're supposed to teach. I know you're supposed to study. I know you're supposed to, and, 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 and I was reminded just of the very thing a few months ago um, that the Lord began to reiterate to me, and that is the call that I have upon your life. And it's not, it's not uh, how do I say that, separate to me, um, but it's also to you. And that is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. This is what he said to his disciples. What is a disciple? It's a follower of Christ. And he said, now go make disciples. So there is to be, and here's what I'm saying, a grace through you. Not just grace to you, but now grace through you. So there is to be an interaction between you and others. There is to be an interaction between us and others. And uh, just, a, just a, um, a couple weeks ago, we had a B-team night, um, which is where all of our serve team came together, uh, and we, you know, um, we had some fun, we had some food, and then we talked, and we talked about some core values, and really what we talked about was this, this word overhaul. Because, uh, and, and, and we likened it like this, that in a season um, of harvest, right, um, or in any season, um, and I, I, I use the analogy of a combine. When you come into a season, you don't wait till that season to overhaul. In other words, change the heads and the blades and so, that it, so that your harvest doesn't just lay on the ground, so, you know, but that every head's working properly. You're not just missing a row every path. You understand? So you, what you do, you, the machine's not, it, you know, these machines are millions of dollars or can be millions of dollars, Right? A combine. So what do you do? They have interchangeable parts. They can be overhauled. They can have things replaced. And that's what we talk, we're talking about even here in Beyond Church. The Lord really had that coming into our hearts that we need an overhaul. We need to sharpen the edge a little bit <clears throat> of, <clears throat> of, of our approach to, to ministry um, as a B team, um, uh, as a staff, et cetera, et cetera, that we need to sharpen the edge and we need to be make sure that we are up and about doing what the Lord has asked us to do. That we are measuring the right things. How many of you know what I'm talking about? That we understand who we're giving an account to because you might, just newsflash tonight, um, you are gonna give an account to somebody and I think right now there's much of the church that's giving an account to the wrong ones. 
We're giving an account to our children. We're giving an account to our coworkers and our friends and all these kind of people. But the one that you're going to have to give an account to is the Lord. So who are you giving an account to concerning all these things? And maybe you didn't realize this, but you're going to give an account for your children, for these kind of things, for what you passed on. Not just what you know, but what gets passed on. And so we were talking about overhaul, and that led me to uh, uh, what we were talk- talking about, really you know, sharing core values and really talking about culture, okay? Culture, okay? And that's really what I want to talk to to, to you and uh, 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 me about tonight is culture and, and how vital cult- culture is. But um, I think it's, there's a few things that we have to settle tonight, and that is, number one, you and I are supposed to affect and I would even say infect the culture in America, in the world in which we live, in our workplace, in our homes. There is to be, the, the culture is not to infiltrate the church, but the church is to infiltrate the culture. This is what it looks like when Jesus said, occupy till I come. Matter of fact, that's a parable where he had 10 of his servants and he called them to him and he gave them some duties and then he told them to do what? Occupy until I come. I'm not taking time to go to all these places. I would encourage you on your own time, take a look at some of this stuff because it'll give you some application to just your day. Because you know, there's nothing worse than not knowing how to track progress, or at least especially for me, I, I want to know that I'm, 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 I'm making progress. Does anybody else just like to just do life and not know that you're going anywhere? That just drives me nuts. You, I, I want to know that, did we get this done? Like, where do we check it off? What are we, how, how are we doing? Like, God is a measuring God. He's a numbers God. He has a whole book about it. I mean, he's, <laughs> Seriously, though, he measures, he measures these things. He me- he's a measure- measuring God. And so there's things that we should know. We should know that if Paul said, uh, or, or he, uh, he said, well, I've, I've finished the course, you know, I've kept the faith or whatever. Um, he, he, you know, I've ran my race. And Jesus said, it is finished. I mean, he had to know that, that, that he had, had made some progress in these years of his life. Yeah. Yeah. My God, I want to say, I'm finished. That's what I want to say. But how, do I, how, how, how can I say that if I haven't even really started? What, or if I'm not even working on the right thing and I'm spending all my energies on these things. And I'm saying yes to so many things. And all my yeses are the, and all these thoughts that are actually vain thoughts are actually the very thing that causes grace, God's touch, to lack in my life. Okay, I, I, I'm going to get back to where I'm at on culture, but let's even just talk about this. Go to James chapter 4, verse 3, uh, verse three uh, through 6. You remember, and maybe you've heard this, uh, you've read this scripture before. It said, talks about how, where do these things war among you? Uh, when, uh, okay, verse 2 said, talks about these things that are warring among you, and there's conflicts, and, and all these kind of things and, that are happening. But here's what happens in verse 3. He says, you desire, there's things that you desire, okay, um, but you don't receive because you ask uh, with wrong motives that you, now I'll go to verse 2. I think I, I should have started in verse 2, okay, there we go. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. And you've heard this quoted so many times. You have not because... Okay, so how many times have we heard that? We've heard that, right? You have not because you ask not. And then in verse 3, he tells us this. But you do, or you do ask, but the reason you ask and how you ask, the motive of your asking is really important to the Lord. What you're asking for, he says, because you ask with wrong Uh, motives that you might spend it upon your own pleasures. So much of our life, because of vain thoughts, and we talked a little bit about this in Hebrews 12, uh, 14 and 15 on Sunday, is that when my approach to others can cause me to fall short or lack the grace of God. When When I'm not living at peace with others, it's because my opinion of others does not match what God says about them. And therefore, a vain thought, okay, the Bible actually tells me in Corinthians, let's go ahead and throw it up there, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, that he says, cast down vain thoughts. Cast down down vain imaginations, which do what? Exalt themselves against what? The knowledge of God. Well, that's what vain thoughts exalt exalt themselves against the knowledge of God, but the knowledge of God is what causes grace to abound towards us. Go ahead and throw up 2 Peter 1-2. 
2 Peter 1, 2 through 4. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through what? Through the knowledge of God. So when, we, when there's thoughts, or is that up there? Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God. So the knowledge of God, or let me say it this way, thinking as he thinks, and you can go all the way back to the beginning in Genesis chapter 1. And I know I'm going fast this, tonight, but there, there's just a lot to, for me to just, that's going to come out. Okay, so all the way back to the beginning, God had a way, and he had a way to think, and he told Adam how, how it was, and all of a sudden, Adam decided to think his own thoughts. And when Adam thought his own thoughts, that which was provided for, that which God touched, that which God created and had in store for him, he left. God didn't leave. He left. He left because of his own thoughts. And so anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God actually causes us to walk away from the grace of God or the touch of that, of that in our lives. And we'll go back to James chapter 2 when there's things that you want, okay, and there's quarrels and you want it so bad, and, and, but you don't have because you ask not or you do ask because you ask amiss. But God can't grant you what you want because what you want is only leading you further from uh, him and, and to fill your time. And, and like, if I have that, then I'm happy. And, if I, and because that's why I'm so ticked and that's why I'm so angry. Because if I had that, then I'd have this. And he says, listen, it's not that at all. But if you would ask him what you need, if you'd ask him, you have not. What you're looking for is he said you're looking for fulfillment, verse 2. You're looking for something to bring what you can't find and you're, you're associating or attributing it to that thing or to that girl or to this or that or whatever it might be or progress, okay? Just progress. I mean, I've been there. I just want to see progress. I, I want to measure something, but you don't have it. And you instead, what I should have done is I should have asked God. I should have asked God, what, what is it that I need? And, and I should have asked God, what is it that I'm to be doing? What is it that I'm to be having? Should I have that car? Should I have that boat? Should I have that? Is that to be my wife? I mean, these things are hugely important, especially in the day and age in which we live. Redeeming the time, the Bible says, because the days are evil. So I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to waste my money, right? I don't want to waste my time. Redeem, buy up the time. Buy up the time because the days are evil. So what are we doing even as a church? Is it what God has said? This is huge. As an organization, are we doing what the Lord has said or are we doing what we always do because this is just what we do? As, 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 just looking at your life, you and I, we need to take some inventory. And the best way to take inventory is to understand that we are not our own, but we've been bought with a price. And that we would have grace for this hour, grace for this day. And the things that we desire in our hearts that we've seen, but we don't know how to get there because they're bigger than us, we need the grace for we need the grace for it. And the way that I'm going to access that grace is come back underneath of him and say, Lord, what is it that you have for me today? What is it you have for us? And when I ask, what happens is, for James chapter 4, verse 6, that positions me, or humble, humility. Humility asks. But that's what, that's what happens. Humility asks. And when you understand that you are under authority or that you are a servant, that, that, would, that in itself should produce in you and I some humility. Some, hum, at least to some degree, humility, where we would say, Lord, you are, you are the Alpha and the Omega. The, you, um, you're the creator. You're the, I mean, I hope we just get a little bit of not just our homeboy involved here, but you're a consuming fire. Uh, wow. And... Uh, you called me by name. You rejoiced over me. And you rejoiced over me so much that you sent your son Jesus to tear down a wall so that you could cherish or touch me again the way that we used to in the garden. This is what you did. And so I realized that I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price and I'm here to glorify you. And what I've realized that in my own ability, even with the glory you deserve, I can't produce. Throw that one out there. and Put that one in your... You know, even the glory he deserves, you can't produce. It takes a touch. And so where humility, when I come under, when I ask, what happens? He gives more grace there. So now what happens is he accompanies what his will is. 
Wow, that, that he accompanies what his will is. And so by even just say, just finding out what he says and coming into agreement with his will by asking, finding out what he says, I partner with him. And a partnering church is a powerful church. And what we need in today's day and age is not a political church. What we need is not a, a, um, a puppeted church. What we, what we need is, is not one that panders to everyone, and we're using all these Ps, but what we need is a powerful church. We need a church that knows who he is, and, and, and just simply by, I cannot know who he, knowing who he is in turn puts right back onto me who I am. This is key, because we're, again, now we're going back to culture, we're talking about culture. And, 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 and doing an overhaul of culture because the culture of the church, the, the world's culture should not be in the church. Matter of fact, it wasn't allowed to be. It, Paul, it, at the city of Corinth, okay, where the church, a church started amongst, let's just say, Vegas, okay, or, or just um, a bunch of uh, goddesses sex, okay? I mean, there's a, there's a temple with open orgies, okay? Um, there was very much witchcraft, all these kind of things, and, 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 and there was all kinds of cheating and lying and stealing and, and people taking advantage of one another. Yet he comes to them, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but with demonstration of power. Wow, in all of 1 Corinthians, and 1 and 2 Corinthians, you see that, that they're admonished and, and talked to about spiritual gifts. Like, wow, these things. And they actually, would, I would say if you look at all the churches, they were the ones that excelled in spiritual gifts above all others. So we know that the grace or the gifts of God, that's a grace, a charis, a charisma, that would be a gift of grace that's upon you. The gift of God or the, the gifts of the Spirit, okay, the working of miracles, okay, the um, excuse me, the working of miracles, where you could say prophecy, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, um, uh, uh, interpretation of like the spirit, like seeing into this, like, just all kinds of stuff. Just every, you know what the gifts of the spirit are? Is the gift of comfort. Let's just, even just throw that out there. When he, the Holy Spirit, the comforter comes. When, you know when Jesus walked in the gifts of the spirit, he was simply bringing comfort. What was moving him was love. It's interesting how 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 is, is, is right in the middle of the, those, those slices is 13. And it's all love, about love. And then he says, pursue love and some spiritual gifts, but pursue love. Make it your quest. So it, it's just really interesting. But even in this culture where they excelled in these things because of grace, not because of their amazing, awesome, holy performance, but because of grace, these spiritual gifts excelled. Yet, he did not allow the culture of the world to remain in the church. He corrected it and eradicated it from it. That's what we see. Paul never made the excuse that, oh, hey, you're in the world. You're going to just have it all over you. He said, this is not how it's to be. And there's grace and a touch of God to even overcome that. So it's just really important for us to understand that, that when he talks to us, even if the things that are going on in this world, when the word of God comes, there is a, a, an empowerment to step uh, and come into agreement with him if I simply would just say yes. Or just, remember uh, in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, I believe it is, where they said, um, where there was a, a promised land, uh, Hebrews 4, 2, I think it is, throw it up there, I think I have it in my notes. For we also have heard the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value with them because what? Because they did not share the faith of those. Like they didn't mix it with their own. They didn't agree with it. When the word of God comes, okay, again, we're going back to culture, talking about setting culture. When the word of God comes to you and me, we have a choice whether or not to agree with it or not. And what I agree with is the values that I hold. And when my value, the values that I hold are not God's values, and I, maybe, I, Lord, to help me communicate very clearly tonight uh, just with just what, I, what I'm trying to say. We have a responsibility not just to have grace to us, but to have grace through us. And grace through us comes when we understand or when we come into agreement and not, not with our own thoughts, not with our vain thoughts, but we come into agreement with what he says, and I come under the knowledge of him, and grace and peace abounds towards me. So now I got it. 
so now I can give it. Okay, so it's huge. And so let me just talk a little bit about culture. And I know I kind of I kind of was going down this way. I kind of really backed up here. And I just want to hit on, I want to just talk a, just a little bit about culture, okay, and how it's brought and how it's taught and so on and so forth. Okay, now listen to this. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. All right. Culture. Let me just define it. It means the accumulated customs, techniques, learning and wisdom of a particular social group. So there are certain things in our culture today that would be customs that have been accumulated. How many of you know that there's some culture right now that's been accumulated really fast? Like cultures change like almost overnight to some degree in some things because, it's the, because another group implemented what they think, okay? And that what they thought was what they thought. And they fought for what they thought. Do you fight? For what you believe? Do we fight for what we believe? Hmm. Interesting thought. Occupy till he comes. Okay. It means the accumulated customs, techniques, learning, and wisdom of a particular social group. Learned uh, rather than innate or genetic. It's a learned behavior. Okay. And it's passed on. Typically, from older or members to the newer ones, maybe in a workplace, they've been there for 10 years. So the culture, you come in, you think you're going to just change the world. And all of a sudden, you just get the sauce all on you. And you're just like, get me out of here. Or you just become part of the stink. How many know what I'm talking about? This stuff happens because of a culture. Okay? And, and then what happens is it's passed on. So it's, it's learned right? It's not only learned, but it's passed on, and then it's continued. So somebody, there, there's not, a, there's not a, a stop in it, because you cannot create culture with words on a back wall. Can't. You can't create culture of a nation by putting the Ten Commandments on the billboard. You can't create culture by, by anything except interaction with one another based upon the values that are held. That's how culture is created. If there is, and so I was, it was so funny, I, was, I found myself reading this article from a, a doctor at Harvard just talking about, talking about culture and all this, this study and all these different studies. And, and one of the things they said, uh, you know, they said that strategy, right? And strategy, uh, you've heard this said, strategy eats culture for breakfast, Okay? In other words, you can strategize and you can come up with clarity and a plan okay, that often accompany with it is rewards and consequences. So you've got a strategy for all of us to be mobilized, right? We're all going to do this. It's clear. One, two, three, strategy. Everybody's on the same page. If you do, you get this. And if you don't, well, you get that. So let's go. Culture. We'll eat that for lunch. Because uh, if, you, if, if the people, if there's things in that organization or if there's things among the society or, or that, that they don't ag- agree with this strategy, what happens is you can have the best strategy, but because people don't agree with the values or they don't agree, their interaction, let me read this because this is, it's amazing how science proves even the Bible. Okay? But uh, li- listen to this, how... Um, Okay, and let me just define culture one. Culture is the norms uh, uh, which define what is encouraged, discouraged, accepted, rejected within a group. That's what culture is. It's what's encouraged, what's discouraged, what's accepted, and what's rejected. So let's just say there was garbage on the floor here. Like, and, we, and, and you just watch pastor walk by the garbage on the floor. And you watch this next staff member walk by the garbage on the floor. And then you watch somebody else... Well, then you just kind of, it just, that, that's what happens. Because culture is set by what's encouraged, what's discouraged, what's allowed, what's disallowed. And as long as the church stays silent, there's things that are allowed. There are things that are encouraged. There's very little that's discouraged. And so the silent majority is not a majority because, because the majority is the minority, which is the majority of the speaking ones, which you and I have been sent here to carry, listen, a culture. 
And to carry a culture, I have to carry values. And my values, if I'm going to carry and fight for the kingdom of heaven that he asked me to carry and asked me to pray for, they have to be what he says. And so if I'm going to have, not just have grace to you and just have it end as a cesspool, but have grace through you, then I'm going to have to come into agreement with what he says. Now, uh, and, 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 okay, and again, the reason you can't just change culture with a policy, or it, it, it's all about interaction, because, let me get to this next part, okay, um, it's not created by what we do a lot, but what are... Uh, but our response to actions and behaviors. So listen to that. Culture is not just created by what we do and allow, but what our response to actions. Just be silent. Just, just ignore it. Just be quiet. Because that's, that's not grace. No, matter of fact, what is not grace and what causes grace to lack is when you and I allow vain thoughts to be exalted against the knowledge of God that's where grace lacks. That's where grace begins to, you understand, this is where you begin to not see the, the grace or the, uh, in, in your life or in, in, in society. God able to have his touch or his own way and his, 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 what he would desire because it's, I'm not going to go with what he desires. I'm going to go with what I desire. God's grace is given to you. It's by grace you're saved, but you still have to appropriate the grace. And that takes your will. Grace must be appropriated through your will. And as long as we just allow whatever will be, will be mentality as the church, grace is not coming through us. We're not carrying a message like Paul, the grace teacher that corrected in the church, brought a message of the good news outside the church, which is the message of Jesus Christ, okay? That, that we have to be doing that. Now, let's, let's go back to culture here just for just a, just a moment. Um, thank you, Lord. Oh, where was I going tonight? Oh, okay, here's the deal. That's where I was going. So, oh, thank you, Lord. So Sunday we were talking about just the touch, the touch of that's really what, what grace is. It's just God, it's like this one's mine, sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of salvation, sealed. Okay, when Jesus got baptized by John the Baptist. How many of you remember this passage? Maybe you don't remember it. We can go there. Uh, let's go, go ahead and go there. Jesus gets baptized by John the Baptist in Matthew chapter, mm, is it Matthew 5? No, no, no. It's the way at the bottom of my notes. I might have deleted it. Thank you. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove and alighting upon him. Okay? So the, this, this grace, or this, the Spirit of God, the empowerment came upon him. Okay? But listen what it says next, and this is huge for you and I to carry grace. For you and I to carry a touch of God, we have to carry this next piece, and that's our identity. Next verse says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went out of the water. Okay, verse 17. And a voice from heaven said this. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. We talked a little bit about this on Sunday, about grace. When grace touches you, okay, it's because he rejoiced over you. But it was the fact, I think this is interesting, that, that God, a voice from heaven, the father, said this about his son. Because your and my identity is huge concerning our approach among others. If, and this is why culture, they, they say it's so, it's so difficult to change because so many times there are things that you think about yourself and yourself, maybe better, maybe worse, but you think them, but you don't vocalize them. And because you don't vocalize them, the policies and the things that are set in place, the truths that would really work, they don't, they don't work because of you. Whoa. So the word of God is powerful. But if you and I don't believe it because we don't understand our identity, we can't carry to the world, right, what we're supposed to carry. 
I can't love you no, the way that I, the world, the way that I, the way that I've been loved by the Father, and carry a message speaking the truth in love if I don't identify with this right here. I, in order to grace through you, I have to, in order, the spirit, I have to understand my identity. This is why identity is so huge even in culture, in, in an organization. Because if, in who you have, have you ever heard this term? Um, uh, you know, the wrong one in, amongst the mix can make everything bad. Have you ever experienced that? Maybe I'm, you know what I'm talking about? Like on a baseball team. You got everybody's a winner and like good attitude. Yes, we can. And then you got somebody that just decides to. There's something about the right dynamics. The right dynamics that you have in, in a room. One, just the wrong one, can kill, in a sense, the momentum, the energy, the, the, all of those kind of things. The, the yes, we can. The culture can shift simply because of poor self identity. Because if I have poor self-identity, the values I hold, I hold. The values I hold, I hold. I can't give to you. I can't tell you my point of view. I can't bring light. I can't be the salt of the earth. I, I can't have the light out on a lampstand. It's got to be in a bushel because what are you going to think of me? Because I already think of me this. I don't know what my father says and I, or I've heard it, but I really don't believe it. I'm insecure. I'm not any good. Somebody's better. I should be this. And the enemy, who is the accuser of the brethren, he'll talk to you all day about who you are and what you're not and what you deserve because it's about your identity. And guess what? If you know who you are in Christ, there's a boldness that you now carry and you now can carry something to somebody and you can carry with you grace. And what you carry with grace is comfort. What you carry with grace is love. And what people need is the love of God. And the love of God is more than words or somebody telling them everything that they're not. But it is someone coming with demonstration and power to make a change to say and say what God says about them instead of what you think about about them because that's so incomplete because you don't even think about yourself what he thinks about you otherwise you would be carrying grace and power everywhere you went so what we need to be done is have a renewing of our mind of who we are in Christ who are you in Christ you are who he says you are. Well, who does he say you are? I don't know. Well, find out and do something about it and carry a value and, and express what you carry. You will never express what you carry if you don't know who and whose you are. Listen, you see this demonstrated and walked out every day at, at school. You see this happen. In your workplace, somebody... Let's, say, let's just put a kid, because you've all been through school. Kid walks in, he's got the bling, he's got the brand new Nikes, he, and he, he's maybe drinking a Starbucks, and you hear you get off the bus, his mom just dropped him off in a Mercedes, right? He gets out, he's got his Starbucks, he's got his jeans, he drops a dollar, ah, oh, it's not worth it. And you're like, snatching that up, right? And he's like, hey, what's up, loser? Hitting people on the way by, right? Like, like you know, maybe, maybe that's an extreme, right? But somebody that, because of what they have, whose they are, they lead. And there's other people. They don't have a Mercedes. They don't have all the name brand stuff, but they're nailed. They're loved. And they lead. It's amazing. You don't have to have certain things, but, but your identity is key, is so key for you and I walking in our destiny. Our destiny. The things that you've seen on the inside. Your identity. As a children's pastor, you ever seen something for the kids? Your identity is key to walk in that destiny. Who he says you are. What he says you're capable of. What has he said? What does he say about you? 
Because it's from that place, here you even see, when the Spirit of God was sent upon him, and the very next verse, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is how I know. Because now, he has anointed me. Well, you know what that word anoint means? To rub. We talked about grace, right? Grace means to do what? To touch. Chairs touched by the gods. Well, guess what? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed. It means to, be, to rub upon the head. I don't know. Maybe it could be similar. I mean, they mean the same thing. It's a different word. But here you, you, you see that the anointing, I receive the anointing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has touched me. It's now upon me. He's, and, 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 and here I go forth. And he says, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, to now set the captives free, to recover his sight to the blind. It was all of a sudden, he, that's the first place he went after this happened. Jesus, after the wilderness, he goes to John the Baptist, gets baptized, okay? Spirit of God comes upon him, and he makes a declaration, God is now upon me for others. And he said, here's how I know. Because now, when I walk by Grandma, that it was sick, she's healed. <laughs> the comfortless, I'm comforting. The, 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 the comforter is upon me. The gift of the Spirit are upon me. The gift, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, he said, I thank God for the grace given to you. Like there are gifts that were given in that town of, of, of Vegas, if you will, Corinth, that there were, there, were, there were women like sitting in a hotel room smelling of cheap perfume. <laughs> right? They had stopped believing There were, there, were, there were people that needed Jesus and all of a sudden someone showed up with the love of God and the power of God to, to, that brought about the re restoration of what the devourer had ate. This is the message of the gospel. Grace not just to you, but grace through you. And that comes through identity. And my identity, only my identity in having the proper self-worth, which is what God says about you, not what you say about you. It's not that I would increase what I say. It would be that I come in line, what that's called humility, that grace would happen. And then what would happen is the values that, are, that, that, that I hold would now therefore be presented. And then even when a strategy, now let's go back to like a corporate world. When a strategy is implemented, right, because of my self-worth, and because, and as a, as a leadership team, and I see something that's off, I will be able to say, guys, I love this, but in my department, because we come in at four in the morning and da 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 da, this really doesn't work here. But if we did this or this or this, and you know what you would happen? Be like, wow, hey, can I have you talk to my manager or my boss? Because that is so good, because I can see how the morale, because you were honest. And you were honest because you were capable of, and you understood who, whose you are. And you understand? How many times do we sit there with no honesty? And we just hold it in. And we don't shine the light for somebody that needs it in the moment. Because I don't want them to think that I don't whatever about them. Well, if you knew how much you were loved, it would be very simple and you would understand that the grace of God, the love of God would flow through you to them. The grace of God flows through you and I when we exalt the knowledge of him. How? Second Peter, let's go back there. Grace and peace to you, to you. Through what? Okay, through the, so it's to you. Oh, good. I'm so glad you came to church tonight because then you can just get some grace and just be touched by God and feel good for you. All right, yay. You know what we should do? We should let that chair and that chair and that chair and all these chairs stay empty because it's more comfortable with elbow room. Let's just have grace to us. Let's just hear what God says about us. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Let's stay in a building this size. Let's just let everyone else... Well, just go to hell and hope that Jesus finds it because, well, I'm found. 
Grace to you. Or is it grace? <laughs> grace through you. That's grace through us today. It's got it's to be that way. It's got to be that way. And grace to you tonight came through the knowledge of him. This is what he says. It comes through the knowledge. So if it comes to you through the knowledge of him, it's also going to come to this world through the knowledge of him. And the only way they will hear is if somebody tells them. Oh, that's you. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Don't just pray for this election and then be like, oh, thank you, Lord. We got Trump. All right, now I can just go. We'll just look for the next one. Now, do I think he, President Trump, I believe, hey, I don't know. That's, I like him, all right? <laughs> Y'all, I, I like him. You do whatever you want. But I'm telling you why, because he stands with Israel. There's a lot of different things that I would say. Uh, what, what I, what I, do I like everything? No, do, do, that's, not my, that's not my job is to like everything, okay? But bottom line is, my trust is not in a man. My trust is to pray for God's plan. And I can tell you, I can tell you that I can, oh my gosh. We need to be and have our trust and understand that we have something to do today. That's all. I mean, that's uh, prayer for elections, night, you know, all this, what we're talking about, everything about the election. Election's great. We, we need to stand in agreement in prayer. We need to vote. We need to use our authority. When the Lord brings something, you need to use your voice because your voice and your prayers pave a way, okay? 100%. But right now, you have been given grace to you, but God wants it through you. Don't be intimidated. Don't be intimidated by the accuser. Stop it. God loves you and he loves them. Let the love of God flow through you. Let the grace of God flow through you. Rejoice over them without stumbling over who they're not so that grace can come. I'm telling you, grace is so powerful. The touch of God is so powerful. Um, what God wants to do through us, through his church in this day and age is so hugely powerful. Do we know who we are? God. In the next couple of weeks, we got a, J a Trey and Joy coming this week, and I'm pumped about that, um, both with Flourish and Sunday morning and Sunday night. And I, I trust that you caught where you got to where we need to, but in the next couple of weeks, coming into November, we're going to talk about our identity in Christ, in Christ realities. Some things that are realities are righteousness. You need to know the blood of Jesus, not your works, has made you righteous. That when God is a just God, okay, and he operates justly, and justice says your sins demanded death. And justice says it must be paid for. And justice, a God that's just, says someone's going to pay. And he says, and I know who. And so when it's paid for, justice does not say pay me again. If somebody paid me 20 bucks because, hey, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Philip just bought a license uh, for uh, little Jeremiah's coming hunting. You know, if I would have took this $100 and pocketed it, and said, hey, you still need to get a license. <laughs> they handed it to me. Would that have been very just? Because he wanted to buy him the license, so he gave it to me, trusting my justness that I would make the right. Listen, when a payment's been made, God's not robbed and said, now, now you pay too. Yeah. Hey, and you too. Yeah. And you too. Yeah. And you too. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Justice is huge. You've heard this statement. Um, what is it? Do justice, love, mercy, walk humbly. It's out of Micah, I think, 6-8. Sometimes we confuse justice and mercy. 
we want justice as something that somebody deserves. But the fact of the matter is, unless justice, and we understand what true justice is, and that is that the wages of your sins, you deserved hell. The world, listen, they deserve hell. You deserved hell. That's justice. You want justice? Go to hell. You want mercy? You got to have justice. Because justice is what makes mercy, mercy. You don't have mercy without justice. You have entitlement. And this is where we're at, even in a nation. We, I, you owe me this. You, no, no, nobody owes you anything. Listen, what you're owed is hell. And sin needs to be talked about. That's what the Bible says. And you know what happens when we talk and we come into agreement with what God says? The Holy Ghost accompanies His Word with signs. Somebody just needs a sign (laughs) to follow, but it can't without the Word. God, we need your help to just simply agree with what you say. Come into agreement. I cast down my own. And I was going to go here tonight and we're done. But I was going to read an article about church leaders from churchleaders.com. Um, just about uh, culture of the world. And a survey that was done by Barna. Um, among four of like evangelicals, Pentecostals. Um, like ones that are just say we're Christian. A mainstream Christian. And, and Catholics. And like 52% of the people uh, that were surveyed. A couple thousand uh, don't believe the Bible is infallible. Um, 43% believe Jesus as a man uh, sinned. Okay? No, it's just as un- it's astronomical. Why? Because it's whatever you think. Mm-hmm. You can sit, uh, and the Word can be preached tonight, and the Word can be preached on a Sunday, and you can have certain things in your life that you're just going to say, I'm going to do that, and this is what I'm going to think, and this is what I'm going to believe about this, about this, about this, about this, instead of coming into alignment, and I can hold to my vain thoughts. And if you can go back four or five weeks, we talked about on a Sunday morning, what you believe matters. What you believe matters. What you believe about yourself and what you believe about the Word Because if that's not a value you hold, you can't carry it, either one. And guess what? You're going to give an account. And the account you give won't be, and it's not a fear thing, this is a reality. This is not even a, it's just like, wow, Lord, thank you for finding me. Lord, where is it in my life? So this is where we come back to, and let's just go back to James chapter 6 and say, he gives more and more grace to who? The humble. You know what you need where, where in the, today's day and age? More grace. More oval team, please. More grace. He gives more grace to those that just simply, I'm going to come under what you say about me. I'm going to come under, come under what you, I don't, I don't understand all, but you know what? If I don't, what I don't understand, I can ask you too. Amen. Oh, thank you, Lord. Let's just pray. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for your word tonight. Father, thank you for, um, that you tonight were, were taken and making such sense uh, of the words that I spoke. Father, thank you for light to our feet. Uh, and thank you for just setting us here and calling us here to this day, to this time, in this season. Father, for the path and the, 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 the steps, Father, in our workplace. Lord, thank you for the, the grace and, and your touch on our lives to occupy that place. Father, every place that we occupy, we just thank you for the grace. We just lift our hands to you tonight, and we just receive tonight the anointing or the grace to stand in our workplace and be a light. Father, in this nation, to be a light, we stand there, and we just thank you for the grace tonight to represent you, to bring you glory, and that men would see your mighty works that are done through us and give you glory. And we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, I'm going to end with this. Grab those kiddos tonight uh, after I, I didn't go real long, but on Wednesday, that, hey, um, can I just take a moment and say something? Okay. <clears throat> um, we're going to, I'm going to probably talk about this just a, mo- a moment on Sunday. Um, 
but I, I want to talk on a Wednesday because it was just something that was brought about um, just the last couple of weeks. So, you know, uh, we've been in what the world calls a pandemic, and, and very much there's been a lot of things that are going on. I'm here to testify that it's been phenomenal at church, at Beyond Church, and just seeing not just increase, but just seeing God moving in people's lives and so on and so forth. However, um, when, when you have a church family, right, and there are, yeah, to say that it has had no impact would be a lie. And to say even on the serve teams that has had a, a no impact is a lie. Um, to some extent, there are some areas of, uh, of our serve teams that as a family are taking an extra heavy tax. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Like in, when something happens, like maybe one area is having to, and one of those areas is, is uh, children's on Wednesday nights. Um, and, and so not only would I ask that you grab your kids, but I would ask in this season until we kind of get things right, if you could serve a Wednesday night and you feel that call in your heart, I'm not asking everyone to, but if you have that in your heart, it's like, you know what, I've, I used to serve in there and I could give up, I could give up Wednesday night so someone else could be equipped and, or, or you know, and come and sit under the word, then I would ask you to do that. Uh, and something I'm going to ask on, and we'll probably have more, way more, you know, but I'm, but I would ask way more than enough, but I'm going to ask you to take, check your heart, um, you know, and see if that, that would be you. And here's why, because we're a family and, and it would be families don't say, well, he never got a piece of chicken and everybody else got a piece of chicken tough. No, what happens is, is everybody does a little bit of slicing off and get, and he ends up getting all, not the bone, (laughs) but all of that stuff. How many know what I'm talking about? That's what families do. And that's what I love even about our house, and I've seen this displayed all through when people's jobs were tough and tight. I've seen family. I've seen, I've seen just even Sunday, we had uh, Miss Robinson uh, in Van Buren School, this kid come in and family getting dislodged because of parental issues and needing shoes and all this kind of stuff. And she said, hey, I can't do all of that, but I know we can. And she said, hey, I got this. I have this opportunity. Can, can, can we come together? And it's like, yeah, absolutely. And I, we just watched this over and over as a church family, see people, man, just get to experience the love of God. And so that's even what we do tonight on Wednesday nights, on Sundays, et cetera. So if you're not serving somewhere, man, I would ask you, what are you doing you know, do, use your gift, you know, steward well, do for somebody, for somebody, for somebody that's back there more often that, when, when, that could hear what you heard or, or, or experience worship or, you know, you know what I'm saying. All right. God bless you. Uh, go to the Connection Center. Uh, I guess Mona's going to go there to have a piece of paper or whoever is there, but make sure that that's happening. Uh, and you can sign up there. How's that? All right. God bless you. We will see you Sunday and Sunday night. You'll want to be here. All right.